Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kaya Carrington Russell, Australian award winning author of Kick Butt Heroines and Dark Fantasy Romantic Worlds. And I have a very special guest for you today. We are talking to USA Today best selling author, known for her funny paranormal romance fantasy worlds. We are talking to the one and only RJ Blaine. How are you today? Hello. I'm good. How are you doing? Fabulous. So much better now that I get to talk to you. I'm super excited for this interview. I'm like- people in after <laughs> quarantine people and I don't know what to do anymore when did you start writing and what made you decide to publish those are two totally different stories <laughs> so story one I was functionally illiterate until grade four I think that's roughly eight years old in the United States uh maybe nine something like that I lived in the like out back of Maryland and essentially they valued sports and going to the Olympics like that's the mentality they had there you're uh either a farmer or you were a country kid most of us were farmers I wasn't I was one of the rare who wasn't a farmer uh so let's say sports were highly valued education not so much it was a blue ribbon school so they were supposed to be like cream of the crop for education I made it all the way to fourth grade, functionally illiterate. I don't know how, but let's just say reading my first actual book in fourth grade involved a dictionary, a lot of frustration, and learning how to sound words out. And that's how I learned how to read. Let's just say I didn't really learn how to write until adulthood. But I liked drawing little stories in the margins of my paperwork instead of working. Go figure. So I played a lot of Game Boy and I did a lot of reading. That was my life, Game Boy and reading. There was like no in between. So writing didn't actually happen until adulthood. And so as an adult, I had to relearn English because I piecemealed it together starting in something like fifth or sixth grade. So I missed all the fundamentals. I just kind of bullshit my way through school. And it kind of is sad when you can think about the public school system going, Yeah, I actually bullshit my way to having straight A's without having a single clue in how how to actually write or speak English. So yeah, I didn't learn how to actually write until adulthood. And I immigrated from the United States to Canada and I wasn't allowed to go to school. I wasn't allowed to work. So I filled my time writing because I was bored when my husband wasn't home. So uh, that's how I learned to write. And then uh, I got laid off from my job after I was able to get hired and all that. And I needed something to do because I was English speaking in a mostly French location. So I decided I'm going to write. Then my, my husband so very kindly said, you know, you either need to shit or get off the pot. And I'm like, oh, you just challenged me. Okay, this is going down now. And uh, it went down. And here we are today. Um, been on USA Today four or five times now. Amazing. So um, I sometimes thank him for telling me to yeah. shit or off the pot. But he was just egging me on to, yeah. to do it. I think there's always like a pivotal moment where people need that bit of encouragement to actually take the plunge into publishing as well, though. One of the um, books I really want to talk about, because like I love all of your covers, your brand is so on point. Um, and I love playing with fire I want to talk a little bit about that series because that has been such a huge hit for you so I'd love to know a little bit for those who are watching and haven't yet read that series what it's about and where you got the idea from one of my friends Diana Farrah Francis who's a fantastic author and I've loved her since I'm actually not going to mention the age because I don't want her to feel bad but I was little. I they, She was one of the first uh, authors I read once I started reading adult material. But she was having a really bad time of it. And uh, she was like, I need something to make me laugh. And so that's how actually how Playing With Fire came to be. I decided, oh, she needs to laugh. So let's go make her laugh. And I just stacked absurdity on top of absurdity. I'm like, I'm just going to like go kung fu on this. And uh, threw in this chick, threw in the hot cop. And I'm like, let's go to town on this. How can I make this funny? So it was just an exercise in writing slapstick comedy. I don't like embarrassment humor at all. 
um, I will stop reading books with embarrassment humor because the secondhand embarrassment is so bad. Like I can't, I can't do it. Um, like I can accept if a character does something silly and, but they're also okay with it. That doesn't bother me. But when the character is really embarrassed or humiliated by it, I can't do it. So all of my comedies is, is like focused. I don't like doing that. So I get this really weird, it's like wordplay. It is, there's some slapstick, but it's only slapstick in the sense of it's physical, but it's not embarrassing for the main character all that much. So it's very toned down. Um, playing with fire, the, the scene everyone remembers is the napalm bender. And it's basically the character gets drunk as a skunk on napalm because she's a fire breathing unicorn and her fuel of choice is napalm and it's very much like getting a really good you know drunk cycle going on there uh like totally fucking smashed and this is one of the favorite scenes in this book because she gets totally fucking smashed and while there's some embarrassment of like oh shit what did i do while i was drunk nobody shames her because of it so you don't have that. She doesn't feel like she's being shamed, even though she's like, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. Yeah. And then she, so she'd hear about it and she's like, oh God. But everyone is like laughing with her and she knows they're laughing with her. So what I do is I handwrite it. I take pictures of it and send her the page of the handwritten page. Mm -hmm. So I hand wrote this book and sent her pictures. And then I sent her the typed up version later. Um, I do, I do handwrite a lot of books. Do you? And then you type it afterwards. I, I do. I do. Wow. Because you're quite a prolific a writer. You write a lot of books as well. Yeah. So, um, I have anxiety and depression and writing is my therapy. Mm -hmm. So what I will do is I'll have the business books, which aren't therapy books. Cause I'm, you know, when I'm writing a, a professional book for release and publication, I'm, I'm doing a job. Uh, these characters have to do certain things. The book has to have certain tones. I have emotional goals through each scene. Sometimes the emotional goal is make myself piss my pants laughing, but whatever, you know, I have goals. Uh, assuming I can find it, I have this digital writing tablet. And I use that when I want to get away from work, but I want to be writing. Yeah. Because when I'm writing on it, it's a pen and a paper environment and it's very nice and I like it a lot. So it's literally just a piece of notebook paper, but in digital format. And I have a little template that goes lines just like college ruled notebook paper and I handwrite on it with a pencil. You have so many books out and you don't only have one pen name either you have three for different genres as well so first of all I'd like to know why you decided to split off into three different pen names and how you manage three different accounts uh, I don't manage three different accounts everyone knows that these are me yeah. uh, it's all run under the same KDP back end I just treat myself like a big publisher it's all under pen and page publishing it's all actually really condensed the only difference is the name on the cover. I'm not like rebranding anything. I'm not hiding who I am. I'm not doing any of that. I'm like, yo, bitches, here we go. I have a new book for you. It's under this pen name and it's this type of book. Uh, what it does let me do is marketing. So when I'm doing an ad on Facebook, for example, I'm not going to be targeting a Bernadette Franklin book, which is contemporary romantic comedy, to people who are looking for dark epic fantasy. My RJ Blaine name, it's all speculative fiction. I have plans to do science fiction in there, but I'm on the fence about having the name changed on the cover because I haven't released any of that yet. I just buy the covers and have them in hand. So I'm working on them. It takes me years sometimes to plan a world for a book. So it'll be like 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there over the course of three years until I have this this nice round little world I can play in. And then once the world is put together, I know what kind of characters happen because I know what kind of society they have. I know what kind of character can be built because of this society. I can just jump in and write. So it sometimes takes me three, four or five years to be ready, but I have a condition called aphantasia. I have no mind's eye. So like if I close my eyes, it's all just black. 
and there's no sound, no memory of taste, no nothing like that. I have the complete version, which really sucks, by the way. It's a disability um, because there's nothing quite like when you are in school and all the kids are being asked to play a game of concentration, all the kids around you have no problems with the game. I can't do it because I have no ability to recall what I just saw. So this wasn't even discovered until I was an adult. Like nobody really knew this condition existed until I was an adult. And then they started to do research on it. Our brains just don't activate when we try to think of things visually in memory. It's, it's a very interesting disorder. So the, my thought process, everything in my life is, is affected because this don't do pictures. It don't do sounds. It doesn't do anything like that. So I think in disembodied words, or more accurately, the impression of words and emotion. So I'm just, when I'm writing a, a book or a scene, I'm going into the scene like, what is my character feeling at the time and what needs to happen? So my action sequences are, I will get up and just do it. Or I will play the finger game on the desk going, can my character like do this? And I play the finger game or I do something or I watch a video. I hate watching videos. I'll do it sometimes, but I don't like it. <laughs> I will, I will, oh, colors. Like what, something that drives me nuts is when somebody goes, oh, is it this color? And I'm like, I don't know what that color is. Mm -hmm. Unless I actually see the color, I can't identify the color. Mm -hmm. Like I know like salmon, for example, is like supposed to be some pinkish color, but I don't know what pink is unless I'm looking at pink. My favorite color is pink, by the way. Um, but when I write, this is a, a barrier yeah. because I'm trying to build all this stuff. And I took a major story detour there uh, when realistically what I was trying to say is I, I segment the authors because I have so much I want to write. I have so much planned. I have so many different little worlds. Susan Copperfield came only because I had 20 or so book ideas and I wanted to follow them all. If I tried to put that under RJ Blaine, it would become unmanageable. Mm -hmm. So I went, I'll just slap a new name on it. I'm not going to hide it from my readers if this is me. I'm just going to use, I use my main RJ Blaine Facebook account for all of my book announcements. And I go to the other pages, just when a new book's out, I'm like, here's a link go away, go see RJ Blaine's thing. That's where all the news is at. Surprise, you got a book. Don't follow my other Facebook pages unless all you want is like book announcements. So the whole reason behind the pen names, marketing, because I don't want to market to people who don't want to read that kind of book. And like, I made a lot of mistakes with the RJ Blaine pen name. There are several series that should have just been their own name. Like the magical romantic comedy should have been its own thing. And it's kind of taken over RJ Blaine. Like that is when people say that, that's what they think of. But I have a lot of other series. I have urban fantasy werewolves with witches. I have the vigilante magical librarians. I have the Fox Witch world. Um, the Fox Witch world currently has something like 30 covers planned. And I have a bunch in, it's, it's, a, it's a world series and trilogies. Do you use the same cover artist? Yes. So. It is Rebecca Frank of Bewitching Book Covers. Amazing. I'm working her, with her. I can't emphasize enough how important having a cover artist who can take your, just, I give her one or two sentences of what the series is about. And she just goes and makes covers to market for what the tone is and what it is. Because for me, I'm not married to a specific scene mm -hmm. in a book. I want a tone. I want an atmosphere because that is what sells books. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere, the tone, and the general cover itself. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of authors, I see this mistake all the time. They envision this very specific scene it has to be just like this the problem is that type of scene doesn't market well i have a fourth pen name now she doesn't actually exist she's a secret no secret secret uh her name's audrey green it's not me okay it's a secret um that's the ongoing joke I, if you ask me if audrey green is me i'm gonna say no but um 
I, I was like, I'm working on a pen name. It's going to be secret because I don't want to be bothered about it. My entire fan base scoured Amazon until they found it. They spent like five days when I said there's going to be a secret pen name. The first one found it within like 24 hours. And I get a message going, is it this? I'm like, I'm not telling you, but yes. I'm like, oh God, they found it 24 hours. That's all I lasted. Because I am one of the few authors who does sweet, not sexy paranormal romance. And they saw sweet, not sexy paranormal romance cover it and went, oh, here we go. Click. Uh Uh-huh. Busted. Because I put the publisher name in the the thing as I always do. Yeah. So the smart ones were looking for the publisher name and then found it. That's clever. Out of curiosity, how quickly do you write a book? Because you're a very prolific writer. You write a lot. Do you want the feel-good version or the truth? <laughs> There's <Wow>. two answers. <laughs> um, however long it needs to take is the feel-good answer. In reality, I can sustain 5,000 words a day. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's a finger breaker, and I'm spending 14 hours plus a day doing it. But I could do it, and I did for, like, the first two years of my, like, solid career. Like, when my career took off... I realize, okay, if I'm making this much money on this book, I need to produce this many books to help pay the bills. Yeah. And that includes the cover art, the editing, et cetera. So I very much was like, okay, my life is writing now. Yeah. And I, I finally gave up. I was like, nope, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to write at my pace. I have two books under deadline right now. I took a little bit of a day off. I only wrote a thousand words today. Um, but I needed to unwind because people were telling me what I should and shouldn't write. And I just had it. Um, welcome to being a career author. Uh, yeah. Happens all the time. The and pressure. There's so much pressure. The pressure is ridiculous. And I have so much pressure, even with people who are trying. So they just want me to enjoy writing. And The thing is, the quarantine has been so hard on people and my books are pure escapism. So as a result, I have a lot of inboxes, uh, messages going, well, thank you because this has saved me through the pandemic. And that's a huge, huge amount of pressure. Um, Nobody warns you about stuff like that when you start writing. It's been interesting. Uh, The pressure is extreme and I'm just cutting it. I'm like, snip, I'm done. I'm like, okay. I want to write for fun. You want books to read. You pay me this much, you read the book. And I'm just stepping back a bit and there's a barrier. And I think every author needs to figure out where their barrier is. There's two things that I kind of want to cover that I found very unique uh, to your brand. One, your website's amazing. Obviously, you have all your different pen names there. Two things that I found quite interesting that you have on there also is your audiobooks. You have a page dedicated to where they can purchase your auto audiobooks. I think I have to fix those links too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the second one is Patreon, which I know a lot of authors aren't necessarily sure of or what they should offer or how they go about it. So what advice do you have on both audiobooks and Patreon? Oh my goodness. I'm going to start with audiobooks because that is actually the easier one to deal with. I do audiobooks because of accessibility, and that's the only reason why I do them. Um, I can't listen to audiobooks personally. Uh, the sensory input just makes my brain explode, and I'm like, I, I want to talk to the video <laughs> or whatever I'm listening to. So I'll be watching a movie and talking to the movie. Like, why would you do that? And um, it changes the experience when you are watching a movie and wanting to talk to it. Um, I just, because it's an aphantasia brain thing, I think. So I do it for accessibility. They're pain in the butt. They're very expensive. My typical audio book bill ranges between two to $5,000 each. So when I put up an audio book, you know, I'm doing that out of pocket just because I want people to be able to do it. They're driving to work for two hours a day and need some entertainment. They are cleaning and and can't read a book, but they really just want the book reading experience. If anything, the audiobook listeners actually get a bigger experience because the the narrators do try to play out the words. They do try to give you that experience. 
but the thing is a lot of people are sensitive to voices. So I can have this perfect voice for, for a character and half the people will love the narrator. The other half won't. That will never change. There's no such thing as a perfect narrator. I love, love, love my audiobook producer, um, uh, Archie Boy Audiobooks Limited, I think, or something like that. Archie Boy Audiobooks, I believe, is what they're called right now. Starting in 2023, I will be holding back retail versions of print and ebook so audiobook can release at the same time. Uh, that ties into Patreon. So Patreon, for those of you who don't know what Patreon is, it is a crowdfund platform. Uh, so essentially, patrons get in together with creators, creators feed the patrons, patrons give the creators money. It's, it's very cut and dry. There are two types of Patreon accounts available, and they go by account. So I have two Patreon accounts, and this is totally allowed. Um, my first account is per month, and the second one is per release. So they call it per creation on Patreon, I believe. I have both set up. And I have readers who do both of them and I'm not really sure why <laughs> I've given up. There are literally, if you get a good strong fan base and they love your books that much, they will buy multiple copies. They will do things like your Patreon and they will just fling money at you if you let them. The key word here is if you let them, you have the choices. And if you're not comfortable with that, you can restrain it. Um, only do one type of Patreon, for example, and if you're not comfortable with people giving you more money than expected, do the procreation. People are not allowed to pay more or less than what you say on the procreation tiers. Per month, it's this much or more. And they plug in the number they want to do for the tier. They can't go below the number you set, but they can go higher. The first time somebody did that, I went, what's going on here? I don't understand this. And then... I realized it could be done and I went to the creators I patronize. Is that even the correct word? I think so. And I upped how much I pay them. My husband's like, what are you doing? I'm like, we listen to this guy for like 60 hours a month. I'm paying him more. Yeah. Paid more. Um, I'm like, no, this is worth way more than $15 a month. Yeah. So I, I like put 30 in or something like that. So the per month is be wary if you're not comfortable with people paying more than you expect the per creation in my case is per novels uh they get a fat fat flat fee of 5.99 and they get the book four to six months before retail does because that's how long it takes to build an audiobook yeah. so my my current game plan is they will essentially be getting uh rather polished arc editions mm -hmm. Um, they will get it after my proofreaders have gone, it, but they will get it before I've done my additional final production passes. Mm -hmm. They will also have access to a report typos link um, specific for, for them. And they can go, if you find anything great, um, they will know that it's not going to be as clean as retail because the retail price in 2023 is going up to $6.99 for a full-size novel because I'm putting that much extra work into it. So the patrons get it for the current $5.99 rate or they're paying per month and they're getting a whole bunch of other goodies. Um, I'm trying to decide how I wanna, all right, we'll, we'll do the per monthly first, I think. Um, it's chaos in my per monthly Patreon. Um, if you don't like chaos, per monthly Patreons are not for you. Um, I do Q and A's, I do short stories, I do random posts talking about writing stuff. I do whatever I freaking want. I draw pictures on my iPad and give them a coloring book page. Whatever tickles my fancy is what happens in the monthly Patreon. It's the wild west of creativity. And my readers love it because they get to interact with me kind of in my natural environment. Yeah. So think of Patreon as putting me in a fishbowl and I am playing in that in that little fishbowl. Uh, they get to see the short stories I would never publish otherwise. They they get a flag. Okay, this is not publishable stuff, but you're gonna get it anyway. It has it has typos. If you can't stand typos, just skip the post. Don't worry about it. Just skip it. Um, don't tell me about the typos. Um, I don't want to know. 
And ever since I started doing that, nobody, not a single person has reported a single type in my Patreon. And it's fantastic because I just go, okay, we're here to have a good time. Let's have a good time. So basically it's a no negativity zone. Okay, so the backlist read, everyone who's a Patreon, I believe it's $5 and higher, gets to read a chapter of a book every Friday. Normally, it's just a normal read-along, except for I include my author commentary on what I remember of what was happening when I was writing that book, any thoughts I had about what happened in that chapter, et cetera. So there's a lot of behind-the-scenes content that we can't do in normal novels. Amazon won't let us, or we just don't do it. Um, Mostly it's interrupting when you're reading in a book format and you have the author commentary at the beginning of every chapter, but when you're doing a read along, they're waiting a week anyway. So it's uh, depending on how the commentary works, I either put it at the top or the bottom. Bottom is if it's a major spoiler for what happens in the chapter. The top, if it's generic and I'm not ruining anything for the readers who are reading it for the first time. So they get the experience of reading the book in a book club format. The backlist is a lot of fun. So how it works is on the the charged per per release ones. I do a charge post at the end of the month before it releases. So I have a book coming out in mid-May. So around April 25th or 26th, I will put up a charged post to the RJ Blaine tier and the Cindercorns tier. They will be charged on May 1st. And when the book is ready, prob- I'm hoping no later than May 9th, um, they will get their copy. Yeah, I will send it. I'm distributing through Book Funnels integrated platform, so it integrates right into Patreon. Um, uh, Patreon lets me know whose cards were charged. I can send messages only to the Patreons who are successfully charged for the post. Cool. So, um, piracy is also going to be not as much of a deal because they can't refund the books, and the i most pirates don't bother with stuff like patreon Mm -hmm. so generally it's going to be a safer way for me to to build my career Mm -hmm. and um patreon charges 10 whole percent and you know 25 whole cents for the transfer fee for the money so yeah, uh, I get paid a lot more. We figured out, I did the math, and $5.99 on Patreon pays me more than $6.99 on Amazon. And um, so I'm like, I love Patreon, and you'll get the books earlier. Can, can you move? Can you move here? And like, I view my monthly Patreon as my day job. Yeah. Um, it's my sole source of consistent income. Awesome. I can look at it and go, okay, well, I know I'm getting this much in a month and the retailers are gravy at this stage. Yeah. And um, my Patreon makes enough to pay my rent. So um, my husband works as well, but it, there's something really nice about knowing if uh, something happened and my husband lost his job tomorrow, I'm able to take care of us just yeah. from the, the Patreon. And the Patreon users are loving that they get the book so far in advance. Like there's a bunch of authors who do like one or two weeks ahead. And like, this is great. And I think it's a wonderful practice because it's more money going directly to the author. For authors starting out on Patreon for the first time, if you don't have a fan base, you're not going to have a strong Patreon. Um, Patreon is not a platform you gain new readers on it is a platform you use to reward your current readers so i don't think i've gained a single reader off of patreon itself um it's all my current fans who are going and going oh i want to do this and like a lot of them are going yeah uh, i joined only because you brought me so much joy during the pandemic i want to pay that back i'm like you you did you bought the book yeah. and, just, and they're like that's not enough and i'm like do whatever you want here it's here you can do it um i just got asked over and over again can we do something more than just buy a book 
and they're already doing the word of mouth thing. Mm-hmm. Word of mouth is great. It doesn't pay your bills, but it's great. Um, because you know that they're sharing the love of just reading with other people. It doesn't mean your books will necessarily sell. Word of mouth is most likely to get your book to sell. But in reality, if you're relying on word of mouth to sell your books, your books aren't going to sell. Yeah. And that is one of the most painful realizations I had going into this career because I was convinced and told by so many word of mouth is king. If you get people talking about your books, your books will sell. I got bad news for you. It's not the case. It's not the case at all. Advertising sells books. Um, Once you're advertising, word of mouth will eventually help sell books. But it's not selling the book solely because they, somebody told them about the book. Mm. They've probably already seen it from somewhere else first. Yeah. Or the person who is doing the word of mouth doesn't stop talking about the book. And then the friend is like, okay, I, fine, I'll do it. I'll do it. I got it now. I'll do it. I got it. Okay. Just please stop. And then, um, then it can snowball. That can snowball. Um, but the odds of it snowballing is very little. Mm. Very little. Um, I thought it would be so much more important than it actually is. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a word of advice, especially if you want to do Patreon. Um, don't go in expecting new readers to fly out of the word book. Yeah. Wood works. I have a segment called Speed Dating with an Author. So you oh. and I are going to go on a very romantic date. I lit a candle. I've created ambience. <laughs> but basically what it is, is five rapid questions. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> what is the clumsiest moment you've ever had? Falling out of bed. <laughs> oh, no, spraining my foot in my sleep while in bed. I don't know how I did it. And I was bedridden for three weeks as a result. Three weeks. So um, that's the cake taker right there. That's um, a talent in itself. So. Three weeks in bed because I sprained my foot while my dumb ass was asleep. That's cool. Um, so is, does that count? Or otherwise I'm taking falling out of bed. It's like, that counts. <laughs> I'll take it. What <laughs> is the three words that best describe you? Crazy, crazy, crazy. Consistent. I like it. <laughs> yeah. what is... um, enthusiastic. There we go. Enthusiastic. Awesome. Crazy, enthusiastic, crazy. I love it. What is the song that best describes you? Um gonna go with bon jovi it's my life i love that song what is your life motto just do it honestly i'm stealing from nike just do it (laughs) Uh, you you never accomplish anything if you you don't do it so yeah uh i got to where i am because i said okay i'm doing it and so i did it and there we go what is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about i can rile up cats without getting the scrap shit scratched out of me if you heard that hiss i wasn't doing anything what oh oh she's upset because i wasn't doing anything you want to play oh goodness gracious what is my special ability i'm a cat whisperer i can train cats there you go i have the patience to actually train cats how to sit roll over Um, my preferred favorite is gentle so we do rough play (laughs) And when the cat gets a little too enthusiastic, I tell them gentle and they immediately retract claws, stop biting. Um, they will do a lick instead. I, don't, I didn't train them to start licking, but that's what they do when they're told gentle. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Licking hurts a lot less than biting. So um, mm-hmm. I had to do this because one of my rescues was taken as too young of a kitten and mommy never taught her how to socialize beyond a certain age. So her, at, at that age of kitten, they bite to show affection. They, yeah. they, their language is biting. And it was a pretty hefty battle teaching this cat gentle because she's 14 pounds of, I want to love you with my teeth. And she's doing it because she doesn't know how to express herself otherwise. Mm-hmm. So before bed, I put out my finger and she goes chomp, chomp, chomp on the finger. And she's very gentle about it. And if she starts applying too much pressure, I tell her gentle and she lowers the amount of pressure immediately and she resumes chomping because she she has an oral fixation. 
mama cat isn't available to teach her how not to do that anymore. And humans can't teach cats how not to do that anymore. So I had to become a cat whisperer. I love that. That's a good answer. I have had so much fun today. Where do we find you? Where do we stalk you? And what do we need to know? Um, stalking can be done on Facebook. Just look up RJ Blaine. Uh, the profile with the dots is my Facebook page. That has all the important announcements. Um, my author behaving badly moments, which nobody says I'm actually behaving badly. I'm like, come on, give it to me once. I want to behave badly. But usually I'm just calling out really stupid shit when it happens. And the, the readers are like, yeah, I can't blame you. And I'm like, oh, okay, that works. Um, RJ Blaine without the dots is my personal profile. Uh, you'll see a lot of Wordle on my personal profile or you'll see my cross book st- or cross stitch uh, pictures. So I can yeah. take pictures of them as I'm working on them and random commentary. Um, my face or my website is the sneaky kitty critic.com. Um, I got tired of maintaining a bunch of different websites and I went, Oh, this is available. Click. Unfortunately, the cat that was the sneaky kitty critic has since passed away, but, um, Zazzle, the, the biter has taken over, uh, the job. So she's now the, the sneaky kitty critic. And uh, beyond that, you can find my books on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Kobo, Apple Books. Uh, Audiobooks are over on Chirp or Authors Direct. And I think Kobo and some others. Um, Beyond that, uh, I don't exist anywhere. Libraries. You can find me in libraries. Just contact Mm -hmm. your local librarian and inquire. Um, I'm available in the Australian library system. I'm also available in the U.S. I don't know what my U.K. availability is. Um, but I've been trying to get library access in more countries than just uh, Australia and the U.S. So hopefully it starts showing up elsewhere. Um, there is some availability in Canada as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. And who knows, watch the space. Maybe uh, we'll get you on next year and see what you've achieved in that time. Sleep. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I could use some of that. I could use some of that. It's been a day. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. It's been such a blast. And uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. Yes. All right. Bye, guys.